Hello, everybody. Welcome to join me back in the webinar series, How You Can Build Great Solutions with a Microsoft Azure Well Architected Framework. Today, we're going to explore together the very last pillar we have in the framework itself, which I believe is a topic on top of mind for all of us, security. My name is Jing Liu, and I'm a cloud solution architect working in the partner organization at Microsoft Sweden. Without further ado, let's kick off today's session. No need to thread more. Security is definitely one of the most important aspects of any architecture we're designing. Ensuring that your business data and your customer data, they're secure is very critical. A public data breach can really ruin a company's reputation as well as cause significant personal and financial harm. That's why today we're going to learn all about the security pillar of the Azure World Architecture Framework. First thing first, I would like to highlight that security is definitely not a new concept that emerges together with the cloud technology, but it has really been there for decades. However, I will also argue that the nature of security as well as people's perception of that have really changed over the years. And some of the assumptions we built on the old models, we definitely have to revisit them and adapt them to the new environment that we are operating in. So basically, we can say that today, organizations, they need a new security model that effectively adapts to the complexity of the modern environment and embraces the mobile workforce and protect people, devices, applications, and data whenever they are located. If you look at some of the examples, from the stakeholder perspective, we no longer have just users and employees, but we also have other characters such as the partners, the customers, and in some cases, and even the bots play an important role in the productivity of the company. The cooperative managed devices are replaced by more and more devices that are not being managed. For example, many companies are using bring your own devices policy, and we also have some other IoT devices running on the edge. And as another result of the expanding parameter, the on-prem apps can no longer be taken as a prerequisite, but we should just accept that now we are seeing an explosion of cloud app that are no longer con being constrained by the corporate networks. And they are running on all sorts of infrastructure technology. A lot of them are running containers, meaning that it's no longer monolithic or tightly coupled infrastructure that we are seeing. And last but not least, it is not enough to just rely on local packet tracking and looking at the logs to identify if there are anything malicious that are harming my environments, but uh, the security operating center, they are, or they might be drowned in an ocean of signals and uh, from which they need to identify which ones are the uh, priorities that should really focus on and which ones are actually false positive alerts that they uh, should simply ignore. So short summary of that, the internet has really started to enable us to really transform how we do things. And now our user population spans across employees, partners, and contractors, and they all bring their own devices. We are storing sensitive data in transformative cloud services, and we have connected devices deployed in our supply chains, in our fields, factories, and buildings. And last but not least, we're even sharing users' devices applications and data with our partners and vendors. All of these facts lead to a conclusion that we can't go back to the old time when security focused solely on a strong parameter defense to keep out malicious hackers. Under this situation, the modern organizations have to support access to data and services evenly from both inside and outside the corporate firewall. The main strategy is the so-called zero trust model. Zero trust as a concept, I would say, is really gaining popularity in the security field over the years. I'm sure you have heard about it in many different contexts. And if you look at the definition of that, you can basically see zero trust as something that rather than assuming everything behind the corporate firewall is safe, the zero trust model assumes breach and verifies each request as though it originates from an open network. 
It means that regardless of where the request originates or what resource it accesses, Zero Trust teaches us to never trust, always verify. If we break it down, we can say that there are three main principles that Microsoft Zero Trust policies really stick to. The first one is verify explicitly. It means that we should always authenticate and authorize based on all the available data points we have. Identity is the first line of defense, which we're going to talk more later on, how, uh, what are the strategies that you can utilize to protect your identity. But for now, just want to highlight that it's one main difference compared to the old model where the cooperate firewall policies are taking definite precedence in uh, priority level. And the next principle is use least privilege access. Here, we should really try to limit user access with both just-in-time and just-enough access and also use other risk-based adaptive policies and data protection to ensure that the person has really the minimum privilege and the um, time-bound access to do what he is supposed to deliver on his role. And last but not least is the important one, we should always assume bitch. In this, we means that we are minimizing the blast radius and segment access. As we are verifying end-to-end -end encryption and user analytics, we are gaining that visibility and driving threat detection as well as improving our defense games. In addition, the zero trust principle should really be applied on all the different layers we have in our architecture. So with that said, we have to also bring the concept of defense in depth. This is the strategy that employs a series of mechanisms to slow the advance of attack that is aimed at acquiring unauthorized access to information. You can basically visualize defense in depth as a set of concentric rings as illustrated on the right hand side with the data to be secured at the center. And each ring adds a layer of security around that data. Basically, this onion approach removes reliance on any single layer of protection. And it also acts to slow down an attack and provide alert telemetry that can be acted upon either automatically or manually. And now let's together try to open this onion and take a look at in each layer, what's the scope that we are focusing on. And I also share some examples that you can typically find in that particular layer. And we start from the core, which is data. In almost all cases, the ultimate goal of the attackers, I would say they are after the data. And this data could be stored in databases. They could be stored on your disk inside your VMs. They could be stored on a SaaS application, such as Microsoft 365, or they are just stored in cloud storage. In all the cases, the people who store and control access to data, they are responsible for ensuring that it's properly secured. Often we have regulatory requirements that dictate the controls and processes that must be in place to ensure the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of the data. And if we take one protection example, we can use encryption technique to protect data at rest, for example, for your Asia blob storage. Then going one step further, we have the application layer. And in this layer, we try to ensure that applications, they are secure and free of vulnerabilities. One aspect that you should really think of is how you are storing your sensitive secrets. Are they really stored in a secure storage medium or they are being exposed in the code? And lastly, making security a design requirement for all the application development is also important. It's not a procedure that you can simply add on as an attachment in the end. That's why we always encourage all development teams to make the application secure by default and making security requirements non-negotiable. The third layer, we are coming to the compute layer. Here we are securing access to your VMs. We are implementing endpoint protection and keep systems patched and current. In this layer, we have vulnerabilities such as malware, unpatched systems, and improperly secure systems. They all open your environment to attacks. 
And the focus in this layer is on making sure that your compute resources are secure and that you have the proper controls in place to minimize security issues. As a consequence, you should really try to regularly check that whether you are applying the uh, application of OS and layer software patches accordingly. The fourth layer we're coming to networking. And the main goal here is to really limit down the communication between resources through segmentation and access controls to make sure that we are only opening up the connections which is needed by the application and to make the applications function properly. Denied by default should be the policy to follow. And some another example, we should restrict inbound internet access and limit outbound where appropriate. And now coming to the parameter level, here you really need to use proper distributed denial of service protection to filter large scale attacks before they can cause a denial of service of users. And these attacks are so powerful, they completely bring down your system so that you can't really answer to the normal traffic uh, and uh, fulfill the normal functionalities what your application is supposed to deliver. So a short summary at the network parameter layer, it's all about protecting from network-based attacks against your resources and identifying these attacks, eliminating their impact and alerting on them are all important steps to keep your network secure. The second last layer, we have identity and access. From the purpose perspective, it's important because we need to control who have access to our infrastructure and uh, have an auto review procedure to monitor that. And regarding how we are doing it, we have procedures such as single sign-on and multi-factor authentication. And uh, of course, auditing the events and the changes are very important in order to understand what is going on. So this layer is all about ensuring that identities are secure and access granted is only what's needed and the changes are locked properly. Last but not least, at the physical security layer, we're really talking about physical building security and controlling who has access to the actual computer hardware within the data center. And with physical security, the intent is to provide physical safeguards against access to the access. And this ensures that other layers can't be bypassed and that loss of theft is handled appropriately. An example is the application of biometric access control to enter the Asia data center. But I would say this layer is mostly the responsibility of Microsoft. Continue on that last note, I would like to share some comments on the shared responsibilities in the cloud environment. As we see the computing environments, they start to move from customer controlled data centers to cloud data centers, the responsibility of security are also shifting. In the old on-prem setup, as you can see, the customer is responsible throughout all the different layers we have in the architecture. Then moving to cloud, depending on if it's IS, PaaS, or SaaS services the customers are using, Microsoft, in this case, the cloud provider, are taking over part of the responsibility, uh, everything definitely from the physical data center and networking layer, and then to different degrees uh, above the different layers that you see on the top. And to add a note on that, the threat landscape is evolving in real time and at a massive scale. So a security architecture is never complete. We can't have the confidence to say that, hey, now it's enough, my system is secure, and I'm not going to do anything about that. In reality, we should always strive for continuous improvements, and that's an effort required both from the Microsoft side as well as the customers. Um, we both need ability to respond to the new threats intelligently, quickly, and at scale. To help the customers, we are releasing many different tooling on our platform, which on a high level provides customers with unified security management and advanced threat protection to understand and respond to security events on-prem and in Asia. One of the platforms that we're going to look at later today is the Asia Security Center. In turn, the customers, they have responsibility to continuously reevaluate and evolve their security architecture 
accordingly in this journey. All right, so now after we have set the stage for what are the overview and the main focus areas of security on Azure, I would like to go a little bit deeper into the specific areas and look at some of the concrete technologies that you can utilize and make your system more secure. The first area we're going to look into is identity management. I guess now everyone understands the importance of identity after we have had the zero trust discussion. Basically, without the physical firewall parameter, identity is really that first line of defense. Here, we'll discuss identity as a security layer for both internal and external application and the benefits of single sign-on and multi-factor authentication to provide identity security. So on the first note, identity as a layer of security, digital identities are now an integral part of today's business and social interactions on-prem and online. In the past, identity and the access services, they are restricted to operating within the company's internal network. There we have protocols such as Kibros and LDAP. They were designed for this purpose. But most recently, mobile devices have become the primary way that people interact with digital services. Customers and employees alike expect to be able to access services from anywhere at any time. And this expectation has really driven the development of identity protocols that can work at internet scale across many disparate devices and operating systems. One important technology to support that is single sign-on. Not a surprise, the more identities a user has to manage, the greater the risk of credential-related security incident there will be. More identities mean more passwords to remember and change. And password policies can really vary between applications. If a user leaves an organization, tracking down all those identities and ensuring that they're disabled can also be very challenging. That's why with single sign-on, the users need to remember only one ID and password, and access across application is granted to a single identity tied to a user, simplifying the security model greatly. And now if we relate back to the platform, we have Azure AD. It's our cloud-based identity service. It has built-in support for synchronization with your on-prem Active Directory instances, or it can be used on its own as well. This means that all your applications, whether on-prem, in the cloud, or even mobile, they can share the same credentials. By using the Azure AD for single sign-on, you will also have the ability to combine multiple data sources into an intelligent security graph. This security graph can help you provide threat analysis and real-time identity protection to all accounts in Azure AD, including those accounts that are synchronized from on-prem Active Directory. By using a centralized identity provider, you will have centralized security controls, reporting, alerting, and administration of your identity infrastructure, which is a really big advantage and prevents silos from appearing in between. The last point I want to talk about is synchronizing directories with Azure AD Connect. Azure AD Connect can basically integrate your on-prem directories with Azure Active Directory. It's a single tool to provide an easy deployment experience for synchronization and signing. And this is also what we call hybrid identity. To achieve hybrid identity with Azure AD, we have three different authentication methods that can be used depending on your scenarios. And the three methods are password hash synchronization, password authentication, or federation. In a nutshell, the first option, Azure AD password hash synchronization, also known as PHS, that I would say is the simplest way to enable authentication from on-prem directory objects in Azure AD. And how it works is to sync a hash of the hash of the password from your Active Directory directly in the cloud in your Azure AD instance, where authentication actually takes place. And here, the passwords, they are never stored in clear text or encrypted with a reversible algorithm in Azure AD. The second method, Azure AD Path-Through Authentication, also known as PTA, also provides a simple password validation for your Azure AD authentication service. But here, we are using a software agent that runs on one or more on-prem servers. 
These servers validate the users directly with your on-prem Active Directory, which ensures that the password validation doesn't happen in the cloud. This option is favored by companies with a security requirement to immediately enforce on-prem user account states and password policies. And finally, we have the further rate authentication. When you choose this method, Azure AD will hand off the actual authentication process to a separate trusted authentication system, such as your on-prem Active Directory Federation service to validate the user's password. And this authentication system can provide additional advanced authentication requirements, such as the smart card-based authentication or third-party multi-factor authentication. For your reference, if you're unsure which method would suit your customer or your organization the best, you can leverage on this decision tree that is produced by Microsoft to help you make the best decision. And now let's move on to another topic, which is authentication and access. There are a couple of subtopics I would like to cover here. First one being the multi-factor authentication, also known as MFA. I would say today more and more users are familiar with MFA because it is very widely used in many different platforms. Basically, it provides that additional security for your identities by requiring two or more elements for full authentication. And these elements, they fall into three categories. First one being something you know, meaning that it could be a password or the answer to a security question. Second being something you have, and that could be a mobile app that receives a notification or could be a token generating device. And last but not least, something you are. And uh, it could be some sort of biometric property, such as the fingerprint or face scan used now by many mobile devices. Using multi-factor authentication, I would say, is a very effective mechanism that greatly increases the security of your identity by limiting the impact of credential exposure. An attacker who has a user's password would also need to have possession of their phone or their face in order to fully authenticate. Given that the benefit is so huge, organizations should really enable multi-factor authentication whenever possible. On the Microsoft platform, Azure AD, we also have the multi-factor authentication capabilities built in, and it integrates very well with other multi-factor authentication providers as well. Basic multi-factor authentication features are available to M365 and Azure AD administrators for no extra cost. And today, the available verification methods include the Microsoft Authenticator app, you can use the OAuth software token. You can use the SMS or the voice call. Then together with that, you can also leverage on what we call the conditional access policies. Conditional access policies, along with multi-factor authentication, really ensures that additional requirements are met before granting access to a user. And it also efficiently adds another layer of protection. For example, you can have the granularity that to block logins from a suspicious IP address or denying access from devices without malware protection, and in this way limit access from risky signings. Azure Active Directory provides conditional access policies based on group, location, or device state. The location feature allows your organization to differentiate IP addresses that don't belong to the network and it satisfies the security policy to require multi-factor authentication from all such locations. For example, in the illustration you can see, user requests to access the on-prem and the cloud applications are first checked against a list of conditions. The requests are either allowed access forced to go through multi-factor authentication or blocked based on the conditions that they satisfy. And for the last topic, we have the option to help you secure your legacy application. Maybe your customers, environment, their employees require secure remote access to their administrative applications today hosted on-prem. Users currently authenticate to the application by using Windows integrated authentication from their domain joint machines behind the corporate firewall. Maybe there's a plan to modernize this architecture, but the timeline is very short. 
then you should really consider using the Azure AD application proxy, which allow users to access the application remotely without any code changes. So in a nutshell, the Azure AD application is very simple, it's secure, and it's cost effective. And what do we mean by that? You don't need to change or update your application to work with application proxy, and your users get a consistent authentication experiences. From a security perspective, when you publish your application by using the Azure AD application proxy, you can take advantage of the authorization controls and security analytics in Azure. You get that cloud-scale security and Azure security features like conditional access and two-step verification. And from the cost perspective, the application proxy works in the cloud, so you can really save time and money. On-prem solutions typically require you to set up and maintain parameter networks, edge servers, or other complex infrastructures, which are not the case here. All right, and the last focus point to talk about identity security is how you can, in the best way, modernize the existing customer interactions and provide that tight integration with other identity providers like Google, Facebook, and LinkedIn. To support that, we have something called the Azure AD B2C, which is an identity management service that's built on the foundation of Azure Active Directory. It basically enables you to customize and control how customers sign up, sign in, and manage their profiles when using your applications. This includes applications developed for iOS, Android, and .NET, among other providers. Azure AD B2C provides a social identity login experience as well, while at the same time protecting your customer identity profile information. And last but not least, the Azure AD B2C directories, they are distinct from standard Azure AD directories and can be created directly in the Azure portal. All right, so now let's change gear again and look at another area we have in security, and that will be infrastructure protection. Cloud infrastructure is definitely becoming an essential piece of many business. It's critical to ensure that people and the processes have only the right they need to get their job done. And assigning incorrect access can result in data loss, data leakage, or availability of services. System administrators here can be responsible for a large number of users, systems, and permission sets. So correctly granting access can quickly become unmanageable and can lead to a one-size-fits-all approach. And no doubt this approach can reduce the complexity of administration, but makes it far easier to inadequately grant more permissive access than required. So what can we do to prevent that? With that question asked, I guess some of you can already guess what's the topic we're going to go into now. Right, we're going to talk about role-based access control. Role-based access control, also known as RBAC, is one of the fundamental concepts to understand in Asia. Using RBAC, you can basically segregate duties within your team and grant only the amount of access to your users that they need to perform their jobs. Instead of giving everybody unrestricted permissions in your Azure subscription or resources, you can allow only certain actions at a particular scope, and that is the purpose of RBAC. When you define a rule, there are three components that you need to define. First one being the security principle, and that is basically an object that identifies if it's a user, a group, a service principle, or a managed identity that is actually requesting access to your Azure resources. Then you need to uh, define the role definition. A role definition is essentially a collection of permissions. It's sometimes just called a role, but if you look at it more closely, it really lists the different operations that can be performed, such as read, write, and delete, and so on. Roles can be rather high level, like the general owner, contributor, reader, but you can also make it more specific that only works for a specific type of resource provider. For example, you can have virtual machine reader, log analytics contributor, and so on. 
there are already hundreds of different building roles in Azure AD that you can simply take it out of the box, but you can't really find anything that matches your organization's requirement. You can also create customer roles, but do check that if there's already a building role that can support that. And lastly, you, you need to choose the scope. And scope here is the boundary that the access applies to. When you assign a role, you can further limit the actions allowed by defining a scope. And this is helpful if you want to make someone, for example, a VM contributor, but only for one resource group. If you take a closer look at it, there are these four levels that you can actually assign your RBAC rule on. And this is also what we call the hierarchy in the Asia management plan. We have from top down, the management groups, subscriptions, resource groups, and resources. And here I can highlight that roles assigned at a higher scope, like an entire subscription, are inherited by all the different child scopes. Meaning that if you make a person, let's say, for example, the owner of an entire subscription, then this person by default will also have owner permission on all the different resource groups and the resources underneath that. In addition to managing Azure resource access with RBAC, a comprehensive approach to infrastructure protection should also consider including the ongoing auditing of role members as the organization changes and evolves. And to help you with that, we have another complementary service called the Azure AD Privileged Identity Management, also known as AAD PIN. With that, you can manage control and monitor access to important resources in your organization. And this includes access to resources in Azure AD, Azure, and other Microsoft online services like Microsoft 365 and Microsoft Inter. One of the biggest advantage of using PIM compared to a normal RBAC role assignment is to allow the just-in-time privileged access to your Azure resources and Azure AD. By default, if you say, let's uh, grant the owner permission for this subscription to a user A, this user will get the owner permission permanently. And in the worst case, if this account is compromised and the account falls into the hands of attacker, the consequence can be very severe. With PIM, you can actually make that permanent assignment to eligible assignment, meaning that whenever the user needs to perform tasks that requires owner permission, he or she will first need to elevate herself to their role, and this can require an approval process in between. And even after that, he or she will only get, uh, let's say, two hours to complete that task, after which the uh, assignment will be invalid. In this case, the risk of having this account compromised is greatly reduced. In addition to the just-in-time privilege access to Asia AD and Asia resources, plus the approval process, we have other advantages brought by PIM, including enforcing Asia AD multi-factor authentication to activate any role. You can let the user always put in a justification to understand why the users are activating the role. And you can also have stakeholders to get notifications when privileged roles are activated. From another aspect, access reviews are also a new capability that is introduced here to ensure that users still need their roles after quarterly review or monthly review and so on. And last but not least, you can also download an audit history for internal external audits so that everything is visible and the transparency is in place. To use PIM, you need one of the following paid or trial licenses. You need to have either Azure AD Premium P2 or the Enterprise Mobility Security EMS E5 license. Next, I also want to talk a little bit about providing identities for services. It's often very valuable for services to have identities and not just users. And this is greatly important if you're doing automation scenarios, let's say, the uh, certain resources need to be created, or you need to actually change configurations in the VM and so on. Often and against best practices, credential information is embedded in configuration files. With no security around these configuration files, anybody who has access to the systems or repositories can access these credentials and risk exposure. Azure AD addresses this problem through two different methods. 
service principles and managed identities for Asia services. If, if you look at the first one first, Asia principles, to understand service principles is useful to first understand the words identity and principle as they are used in the world of identity management. An identity is simply a thing that can be authenticated. Obviously, this includes users with usernames and passwords, but it can also include applications or other servers, which might authenticate with secret keys or certificates. A principle, on the other hand, is an identity that acts with certain roles or claims. Consider the use of sudo on a bash prompt or on Windows via run as administrator. In both of these cases, you are still signing as the same identity as before, but you've changed your role. With that said, a service principle is literally named. It's an identity that a service or application uses. Like other identities, it can be assigned roles. For example, your organization can assign its deployment script to run authenticated as a service principle. If that's the only identity that has permission to perform destructive actions, the organization has gone a long way toward making sure that it doesn't repeat the accidental resource deletion. Then we have the other option, manage identities for Asia resources. The creation of service principles can be a tedious process. There are also many touch points that can make maintaining service principles difficult. Managing identities, on the other hand, for Asia resources are much easier and will do most of the work for you. A managed identity can be instantly created for any Asia service that supports it. When you create a managed identity for service, you are creating an account on the Asia AD tenant and Azure infrastructure will automatically take care of authenticating the service and managing the account. You can then use that account like any other Active Directory account, including letting the authenticated service securely access other Azure resources. When we talk about infrastructure security, there's no way that we don't mention one of the most important tooling we have on the platform, Azure Security Center. Azure Security Center is that unified infrastructure security management system that really strengthens the security posture of your data centers, as well as providing the advanced threat protection across your hybrid workloads in the cloud, whether they are running in Azure or could be running on-prem or the other public cloud service providers' data centers. In a nutshell, we can group the features of Azure Security Center into two main buckets as illustrated on this slide. We can look at them as the preventive side of the story or the reactive side of the story. If we first take a look on the right-hand side, there we have the so-called Cloud Security Posture Management Module. Basically, it will do analysis of your environment, your infrastructure, understanding what is your current security hygiene or your security posture. And the result you'll be getting is a secure score, together with a list of concrete recommendations, what you can do in order to get even higher score. And this is very efficient to let you detect whether there are presence of any security misconfigurations. For example, if we detect that you are actually not enabling MFA to control your user signing, it will give that as a recommendation. And after you have taken the remediation, you will have higher score. At the same time, you can also do compliance check with the built-in policies, as well as see what you have in your access inventory today. Last point to highlight, the preventive side of the story, the security score, that is completely for free, so there's no reason not to use it. Then we have the left-hand side, the cloud workload protection, and it is also called the Azure Defender. This part really brings that advanced and intelligent protection of your Azure and hybrid resources and workloads in place. It is important to have security hygiene, but it's also very important to have an efficient detection and remediation mechanism when attack actually happens. 
So with Asia Defender, we are having concrete threat detection and remediation capabilities, which are tailored for your different workloads on Asia. Everything from VM, databases, storage, key vaults, SQL database, and so on and so forth. And you will get the most comprehensive protection you need to protect your infrastructure. In addition to the building policies, compliance evaluation with Asia Defender, you can also add custom policies and initiatives. For example, you can add regulatory standards such as uh, GDPR, NIST, Asia CIS, as, um, and together with some others for truly customized view of your compliance requirements. Following on that, Asia Defender provides security alerts and advanced threat protection based on your workload types. And uh, I already mentioned some examples, VMs, SQL databases, containers, web applications, and so on and so forth. And here you have a concrete map. I also want to highlight that this is a map that is updating constantly. And in the latest view, as you can see here, most of the workloads are already in GA, meaning that they are production ready. So whenever you enable Asia Defender from the pricing and settings area of Asia Security Center, the following Defender plans are all enabled simultaneously and provide comprehensive defenses for the workloads that you have in your environment. But of course, you can also customize that some of the protections, they work on the individual instance level of the uh, workload. For example, with Azure storage, you can actually turn it on only for certain Azure storage accounts. And you can prevent attacks such as the hash reputation check. You can see if there's a mass upload and download of malicious files and so on, just an example. And for some other resources such as Azure Key Vault, such as Azure Defender for Key Vault, this can only be turned on on the uh, entire subscription level. I'm not going to go in details in any of this particular Asia Defender product, but I'm going to put the link in the resource if you are interested to know in particular how some of these modules function. With that said, now I will actually do a demo to show you some of the most important features you can get out of Asia Security Center. All right, so hopefully now you can see my demo environment. I have already entered Security Center and uh, I'm using one subscription to get the data from. On the overview page, I can already see a very clear indication of what is my secure score. And that is the uh, preventive side of the story that I was talking about. And in this subscription, you can see that I have achieved 50% of all the possible points I can. And um, yeah, I will soon later go into details to see how I can get the score even higher. But before that, just want to show you, you can also see what are the most important insights Security Center has on your infrastructure. And from the Azure Defender perspective, what are the different alerts that are being triggered uh, in the recent time span? And other than that, you can also see a dashboard of how you're doing with your regulatory compliance status. But now let me first go to the secure score. And I'm choosing my subscription. So now you can see uh, I have my score, 56%. And then what are the different recommendations I'm getting? As you can see, I have completed 33 out of 53 recommendations. So there's definitely room for improvement. So now going to details, I can uh, just take some of the examples. I have already enabled MFA for this point, I'm green. But then for the second point, uh, secure management ports. And there I can see that some of my machines are not following the recommendations. I, can, uh, I need to remediate them by maybe closing down the management ports on my VMs when we are not using them. And then let's take on this one, re remediate vulnerabilities. I currently don't have vulnerability assessment solution enabled on six of my seven VMs that are being identified on these machines. So let me take this recommendation and see what I can do to, to uh, remediate that. So when I go into this particular recommendation, I can see the detailed remediation steps, what I can do. And actually there's also this quick fix logic. So if I click here, 
I will get the script to let me know uh, how I can uh, remediate this problem the fast way as possible. And let's look at another one. We have, uh, let's take this management port should be closed on your VMs. And I'm again getting the detailed remediation steps, what I need to do in order to uh, fix this recommendation. All right, and now I'm moving on to another module. I'm going into the regulatory compliance. As you can see, I have already enabled some of the uh, compliance standards. And I can show you, for example, for the PCI DSS, these are crucial for my financial customers. And these are the different regulatory compliance that are being identified by the, uh, the standard itself. And we have already the mapping to let you identify how the customer is doing regarding the detailed clauses. And if it's showing red, I can also go into detail to see how I can, what is the customer's responsibility in order to fix that. And last but not least, let me go into Azure Defender and show you the other side, the, uh, the advanced cloud protection workload functionality. So in Azure Defender, you can see I have already turned on my protection for my servers, Kubernetes, my app services, key vaults, SQL servers, storage, and so on. And this is the overall alert uh, dashboard that I can refer to. But I can actually directly go into the security alerts feature and see what I have uh, on my machine. For example, here I can see I have a suspicious authentication activity alert being identified on my uh, Windows server enabled by Azure Arc. So this is also showing that Azure Security Center works not only for Azure native resources, but also on the hybrid resources that are being enabled using Azure Arc. So I want to see the details of this alert. You can show me uh, when this alert actually happens, what's the number of failed authentication attempts, and how I can uh, take action to mitigate these threats. And this is uh, similar to the recommendations, you're not just given a status what is going on, but you're provided with concrete steps what you can do to actually make it better. And other than the manual mitigation, you can also trigger automated responses by using a runbook or in this case, the Azure Logic app in order to fix the issue as soon as possible. Azure Defender comes also with some other advanced protection. For example, with a just-in-time VN access, there you can uh, configure some rules to make sure that a VM's uh, management port, let's say the RDP connection for Windows Server, is only open for a certain amounts of time when a user requests that. And this can drastically decrease the risk that this uh, port is being compromised by an attacker. And that will summarize a short tour of the Asia Security Center. All right, now let's come back to the slides. And uh, we also officially leave the topic of infrastructure and start exploring another very exciting one, data security. I guess no one is against the idea that data is an organization's most valuable asset. And when we talk about how you can prevent the data, I'm sure one of the concepts that definitely would be brought up is encryption. Encryption serves as the last and the strongest line of defense in the layer security strategy for data. And here we'll take a look at what encryption is, how to approach encryption of data, and what encryption capabilities are available on Azure. And if we start from the beginning, encryption is actually nothing but the process of making your data unreadable and unusable. To use or read the encrypted data, it must be decrypted first, which requires the use of a secret key. And there are two top level types of encryption, the symmetric and the asymmetric encryption. If you first take a look at the symmetric encryption illustrated on the left hand side, in this way, we are using the same key to encrypt and decrypt the data. Consider a password manager application. You enter your passwords and they're encrypted with your own personal key. When the data needs to be retrieved later on, the same key is used and the data is then decrypted. And then with the asymmetric setup, 
we are using two different keys in the process, the public key and the private key. Either key can encrypt, but can't decrypt its own encrypted data. To decrypt, you need the paired key. And asymmetry encryption is used for things like TLS and data signing. Both symmetric and asymmetric encryption play a role in properly securing your data. And if we then look at encryption from another categorization perspective, you can approach it in two ways, either encryption at rest or encryption in transit. And first, let's take a look at encryption at rest. Well, data at rest is the data that has been stored on a physical medium. And this might be data that is stored on the disk of a server, data that is stored in the database, or data that is stored in the storage account. Regardless of the storage mechanism, encryption of data at rest ensures that the stored data is unreadable without the keys and secrets needed to decrypt it. If an attacker obtained a hard drive with encrypted data and didn't have access to encryption keys, the attacker would have great difficulty compromising the data. In such a scenario, an attacker would have to attempt attacks against encrypted data, which is much more complex and resource consuming than accessing unencrypted data on the hard drive. Then let's take a look at encryption in transit. Data in transit is the data that's actively moving from one location to another, such as across the internet or through a private network. An organization can handle secure transfer by encrypting the data before sending it over a network or setting up a secure channel to transmit unencrypted data between two systems. Encrypting data in transit protects the data from outside observers and provides a mechanism to transmit data while limiting risk of exposure. The following illustration is an example of encryption in transit. As you can see here, the data is encrypted before it's transferred. After the data reaches the destination, it is again decrypted so that users can understand what is written in there. And if you go one step back, to encrypt or not encrypt, that is another question. Well, in practice, it is definitely not cost efficient or even not realistic to just say we want to encrypt everything we have. By taking inventory of the types of data being stored, the organization can get a better picture of where sensitive data might be stored and where existing encryption might or might not be happening. So it is actually a very important activity to tag your data correctly so that we know what are the protection procedures that we actually need to perform to them afterwards. Here, a thorough understanding of the regulatory and business requirements that apply to data that the organization stores is very important. The regulatory requirements that an organization must, must adhere to often drive a large part of the data encryption requirements. For example, here in Europe, we have GDPR, which defines the handling of personal data in the EU boundary, and other industries will fall under different regulatory requirements as well. For example, a financial institution might store account information that falls within the payment card industry PCI standards. Business requirements might also dictate that any data that could put the organization at financial risk needs to be encrypted. Competitive information falls in this category, I would say. After you have classified the data and defined your requirements, you can take advantage of tools and technologies to then implement and enforce encryption in your architecture. And uh, in the end, I can also mention that to help you do identification and classification of data, we have long the Microsoft Information Protection product twist that help you to do it on the Microsoft 365 side and the other SaaS applications. And recently, we also launched a new product, Asia Purview, that allow you to extend that capability also to Asia, to the various databases that you can find, including the uh, Asia SQL database, storage account, and so on. All right, and now let's go back to encryption. We have already looked at the definition of encryption, what are the different approaches, and how you can apply it in the different places in your architecture. And now I would like us to take a look together at some of the common ways how Azure can enable you and your customers to encrypt data across the different services we have. 
First of all, we have the raw storage encryption. And here we mainly focus on Asia storage. Well, Asia storage encryption for data at rest definitely help your customers to protect the data to meet the organizational security and compliance commitments. Here, the Asia storage platform automatically encrypts your data with 256-bit advanced encryption standard, also known as AES encryption, before processing it to disk. And then later on, it will also decrypt the data during retrieval. Well, this handling of decryption is completely transparent to applications that use the service, which means that you don't need to add any code or turn on any features by yourself in order to use that. In this way, you can either use the Microsoft Managed Encryption Keys with Azure Storage Encryption, or you can use your own encryption keys by selecting this option in the Azure portal. Azure Storage automatically encrypts data in all the Azure Storage services, including the Azure Managing Disk, Azure Block Storage, Azure Files, Azure Queue Storage, and Azure Table Storage. And it also applies on both the performance tiers, meaning both standard and the premium tiers are covered here. Then move on, we have the virtual machine encryption. Why Azure Storage provides the low-level encryption detection for data written to your physical disk, you might wonder how do you actually protect the virtual hard disk of virtual machines? Well, the answer here is Azure Disk Encryption, and that is the capability that helps you encrypt your Windows and your Linux IS virtual machine disks. Azure Disk Encryption here uses the industry standard BitLocker feature for Windows and the DMCrypt feature for Linux to provide volume encryption for the OS and the data disk. This solution is integrated with Azure Key Vault to help you control and manage the disk encryption keys and secrets. And you can use the managed identities that we talked about earlier on for Azure services for accessing the key vaults. Then next we have the database encryption. Many customers today are already using Azure SQL databases to store their data. And the common security requirement is to make sure that if the data files, log files, or maybe uh, backup files are stolen, they are unreadable without access to the encryption keys. Here we have a feature transparent data encryption that helps protecting Azure SQL databases, Azure Data Warehouse, as well as the newer product, Azure Synapse Analytics Data Files against the threat of malicious activity. It basically performs real-time encryption and decryption of the databases, associated backups, and transaction log files at rest without requiring changes to the application itself. By default, transparent data encryption is enabled for all newly deployed Azure SQL databases. And transparent data encryption encrypts the storage of an entire database by using a symmetric key called the database encryption key. But do note that bring your own key is also supported with keys stored in Azure Key Vault in this case. Then another one, we have the always encrypted feature in Azure SQL that you can encrypt data within client applications prior to storing it in Azure SQL database. You can also enable delegation of on-prem database administration to third parties and maintain separation between those who own and can view the data and those who manage it but should not have access to it. Then second last, we have the secret encryption. We have seen that the encryption services all use keys to encrypt and decrypt data. And how do we make sure that the keys themselves are secure? I have actually already mentioned a couple of times, the answer is Azure Key Vault. This is the cloud service that works as a secure store for secrets, keys, and certificates. And Key Vault allows you to create multiple secure containers called vaults. And these vaults are backed by hardware security modules, and they can help reduce the chances of accidental loss of security information by centralizing the storage of application secrets. The vaults also control and log the access to anything that's stored in them. In addition, Azure Key Vault can handle requesting and renewing transport layer security certificates to provide a robust certificate lifecycle management solution. 
And Kivo is also designed to support any type of secret. And these secrets could be password, database credentials, API keys, and certificates. And last but not least, we also have the procedures to let you encrypt your backups. Well, encrypting all your data will not really help your customer if the daily backup of the system are not being taken into account. The customer might be already using Azure Backup to backup data from on-prem machines and Azure VMs. The backups can include files, folders, machine system state, and also the other app-aware data. By default, all the data is stored encrypted at rest, and Azure Backup encrypts local backups by using exactly the same mechanism, the AES-256 that is used for Azure Storage, and also a key created from the past phrase configured by the administrator. That data is securely transferred to Azure through HTTPS. The already encrypted data is then stored on the disk. Now leaving encryption behind, we are moving on again. We are going to talk about network security. Well, securing your network from attacks and unauthorized access is an important part of any architecture. As part of preparation for its cloud migration, the customers must take the time to plan its network infrastructure. Network security in general is about protecting the communication of resources within and outside the network itself. The goal is to limit exposure at the network layer across your services and systems. And by limiting this exposure, you can decrease the likelihood that the resources can be attacked. For network security, an organization can focus its efforts on the following areas. The first one is securing traffic flow between applications and the internet. Network attacks will most often start outside your network, so by limiting the internet exposure and securing the parameter, you can reduce the risk of being attacked. Then the second focus area is how you can secure traffic flow among the different applications. And here our focus is on data that is between applications and their tiers, between different environments, and also in other services within your network. By limiting exposure between these resources, you will reduce the effort that a compromised resource can have, and this can help reduce further propagation within the network. Lastly, we also have the traffic securing flow between users and an application. And this basically limits exposure that your resources have to outside attacks, and it provides a secure mechanism for users to utilize your resources. A common thread throughout this session, you might have already guessed, has been taking a layered approach to security. And this approach is no different at the network layer itself either. It's definitely not enough to just focus on securing the network parameter or focusing on the network security between services inside a network. A layered approach here can provide that multiple layers of protection so that if an attacker gets through one layer, further protections are in place to limit the attack. And now let's take a look at how Azure can provide the tools for a layered approach to secure your network footprint. If you start on the parameter of the network, you are focused on limiting and eliminating attacks from the internet. A great place to start is to access the resources that are internet facing and allow inbound and outbound communication only where necessary. Here you should identify all the different resources that are allowing inbound network traffic of any type, ensure that they're necessary and restricted to only the required ports and protocols. This information can be, for example, looked up in Asia Security Center. There are actually a couple of ways to provide inbound protection at the parameter level. For example, you can utilize Azure Application Gateway, which is a level 7 load balancer that also includes a web application firewall to provide advanced security for your HTTP-based services. It provides protection from commonly known vulnerabilities such as cross-site scripting and SQL injection. In the following diagram, the WAF feature of the application gateway protects the system from malicious attacks, 
the load balancer distributes the legitimate request among virtual machines. Well, for protection of non-HTTP-based services or for increased customization, you can use network virtual appliances to secure your network resources. The NVAs, they are similar to firewall appliances that you might find in on-prem networks and are available from popular network security vendors. NVAs can provide greater customization of security for those applications that require it, but they increase, on the other hand, also complexity. So we definitely recommend that you carefully consider your requirements or your customers' requirements. Any resource exposed to the internet is at risk for denial of service attack. And these types of attacks try to overwhelm a network resource by sending so many requests that the resource becomes slow or even unresponsive. To mitigate these attacks, you can utilize Azure DDoS protection, which provides basic protection across all the Azure services and enhanced protection for further customization for your resources. DDoS protection blocks attack traffic and forwards the legitimate traffic to its intended destination. And within a few minutes of attack detection, you'll be notified through Azure Monitor Matrix. And now let's take one step in and take a look at what is happening inside a virtual network. Well, here it is very important to limit the communication between your resources to only what is required. For communication between your VMs, network security groups are a critical piece to restrict unnecessary communication. The network security groups, also known as NSG, they operate at layer 3 and layer 4. They basically provide a list of allowed and denied communication to and from network interfaces and subnets. Network security groups, they are fully customizable and enable you to lock down network communication to and from your VMs. By using the NSGs, you can isolate the applications between environments, tiers, and services. The following diagram, as you can see, shows how a network security group restricts the backend and the middle tier from communicating directly with the internet. And the front end will then receive the internet request and then pass them to the middle tier. The middle tier in turn communicates with the backend. If your purpose is to isolate Azure services to allow communication only from virtual networks, you can use virtual network service endpoints. With service endpoints, you can secure Azure service resources to your VNet. And securing service resources to a VNet provides improved security by fully removing public internet access to resources and allowing traffic only from your VNet. This technique can help you to reduce attack surface for your environment, can reduce also the administration required to limit communication between your VNet and Azure services, and last but not least, providing that optimal routing for this communication as well. All right, now it's finally time for us to move into the last topic of the security talk. We're going to look at application security. We know that hosting application on the cloud platform has provided many advantages over traditional on-prem deployments in terms of agility and flexibility. Well, the cloud shared responsibility model moves security at the physical layer buildings and also the host levels under the control of the cloud provider. And attacker who tries to compromise the platform at this level, they will see diminishing returns versus the considerable investment and insight that providers make in securing and monitoring their infrastructure. On the other hand, it's far more effective for the attackers to pursue vulnerabilities introduced at the application level by the cloud platform customers. That's why it's an area that requires also extra attention. In a nutshell, the primary areas that concern customer applications include the following. Secure application design, data security, identity and access management, and endpoint security. We have actually already talked about some of the topics from the beginning. There's some overlap. And now we're going to continue to exploration and see what is relevant in this area. There's another important framework that is relevant here. It is called the Security Development Lifecycle, also known as SDL. 
what can see the Microsoft security development lifecycle process during the application design stage to ensure that security concerns are incorporated in the software development lifecycle. Here, security and compliance issues are far easier to address when you are designing an application and can mitigate many common errors that can lead to security flaws in the final product. Fixing issues early in the software development journey is also far less costly. A software project can then use this typical sequence of SDL steps as illustrated in the diagram. As you can see, the SDL consists of a set of different practices that support security assurance and compliance requirements. In summary, the SDL can really help the developers build more secure software by reducing the number and severity of vulnerabilities in software while reducing development costs. If you want to know more in this area, you can find a link in the resource list to see uh, what are the details that you can find under these practices. Last but not least, I also want to bring up a couple of common defenses that you can utilize for your application layer. The first one is identity as the parameter. Well, we have already talked about this, but just to highlight again that identity validation is absolutely becoming the first line of defense for your applications. Restricting access to a web application by authenticating and authorizing sessions can drastically reduce the attack surface area. You can, for example, use the Asia Active Directory and Asia Active Directory B2C that we talked about earlier as an effective way to offload the responsibility of identity and access to a fully managed service. Asia AD conditional access policies privilege identity management and identity protection controls further enhance your ability to prevent unauthorized access and audit the changes that are happening to your application. And the second point is again about data protection. Like I mentioned before, customer data is absolutely the target for most, if not all the different attacks against web applications. The secure storage as well as transport of data between an application and its data storage layer is very important. So here is key for you to sit down with your customer, first help them to identify what are the sensitive data that they need to protect. And this can greatly depend on what's the industry your customer is based in and what are the different regulatory compliances that they have to respect. And then after that, you can use the different encryption techniques. And then we have other protection as well to help the customers uh, prevent the data from being compromised. Maybe to add one point, uh, and now we're talking about applications. If you are encrypting data that is stored in Asia blob storage, you can actually use the client-side encryption to encrypt the data in memory before it is written to the storage service. And we have libraries that support this encryption available for .NET, Java, and Python. And these libraries enable the integration of data encryption directly into applications to enhance data integrity. The last point to call out is the importance to secure key and secret storage. Separating application secrets like connection strings or password and encryption keys from the application that's used to access the data is very vital. Encryption keys and application secrets, they should never be stored in the application code or configuration files. Instead, you should always use a secure source such as Azure Key Vault. Access to this sensitive data can then be limited to application identities through managed identities for Azure resources. You can also do key rotation on a regular basis to limit exposure if encryption keys are leaked. You can also choose to use your own encryption keys generated by on-prem hardware security modules. You can even mandate that Azure Key Vault instances are implemented in single tenant discrete HSMs. Okay, and now I would say it's a good time for you to give a clap on your shoulder because we are again arriving at the summary slide of today's session. So basically, today we walked through the many principles of the security pillar of the Asia Well Architecture Framework. And this is also the last pillar that we are doing a deep dive in. What have you learned? 
Well, first we started looking at how you can approach security in your architecture in general through defense in depth and zero trust. Looking only at firewalls or anti-malware, for example, isn't enough to slow down attackers. That's why you should always use a layer approach and address security at each layer. Then we talk through identity management and how identity becomes an integral piece of the architectural puzzle. For example, Asia AD has features and capabilities to improve identity services for your environment. You saw strategies and features to protect access to your infrastructure as the next chapter. Proper protection ensures that the resources you create are administrated by only those who should be administrating them. And we also have Asia Security Center as an important tooling that you can utilize to step up your game. After that, we moved on to data security and talked about how encryption is often the last layer of defense against access to your data. By using encryption, you make your data unreadable to anyone without the decryption keys, and you should identify and classify your data, which is a necessary step before you apply any protection mechanism. After that, we talked through securing your network. We looked at ways to secure traffic flow between applications and the internet and described some ways to secure traffic flow among applications. And in the very end, we wrapped up by looking at how you can secure your application security, for example, by securing traffic flow between users and the application. We looked at some of the common different strategies as well as introduce you to the Microsoft SDL framework for your developers. As usual, here are a list of resources. You can use the links to deep dive more into the area of Asia security in general. We have a fantastic resource, Asia Security Benchmark, which provides prescriptive best practices and recommendations to help organizations improve the security of workloads, data, and services on Asia. The Zero Trust Guidance Center, there you can find a lot of good high-level information and uh, why Zero Trust is so important. Then we also have some articles on Microsoft Docs that can uh, give you guidance how you can configure your hybrid identity, um, what are the ways to configure encryption with customer managed keys, which are stored using Azure Key Vault. You can read more about the PIM service, Privilege Identity Management. That's the feature we have under Active Azure Active Directory. Uh, and then we also have the Asia Security Center documentation as well as the security development lifecycle, as they are if some of the customers who are application oriented. And now we are moving to the final Q&A. And today I have one question prepared. Sometimes we get asked this question, what's the difference between service principles and managed identities? And how would you choose when you are uh, giving an identity to a service rather than a user? Well, I would say both are approaches to allow an application to authenticate itself to the other services. And managed identities, this, you can actually think of them as a kind of service principles of a special type, which are locked to only be used with Asia resources. So when the managed identity is deleted, the corresponding user principle is also automatically removed. Also, when a user assigned or system assigned identity is created, the managed identity resource provider issues a certificate internally to that identity. So I would say if the service that you are using supports managed identities, that is the first option you should go for. With that question answered, I can now officially thank you for joining me in today's session, where we have the deep dive on the security pillar in the Asia Well Architecture Framework. And this is also the last pillar that we're going to go through. If you miss any of the previous sessions, you can always go back and uh, listen to them. With that said, thank you for listening and hope to see you again.